So by that, welcome back everybody. It's time for our first keynote uh, within LCN 2020. It's a great honor to host um, Professor Arkady Saslavsky's keynote this morning. Uh, Arkady is a professor of distributed and systems and security at Deakin University um, in Melbourne, Australia. It was supposed to be a close by connection to Sydney. Now it's a close by connection over Zoom. Um, Arkad is leading and participating in many R&D projects in IoT, mobile analytics, and context awareness um, areas. He has been a technical leader of a big project. I think he will get back to that, Biotalk, priced in 2020. And uh, he has also an adjunct professorship from many universities around the globe. He was also our chair professor at LTU, so it's very nice having you here. And uh, also having Arkad as my academic grandfather, I usually... Uh, talk it about that way because he was the advisor of my advisor so it's very good to keep the connection up so by that i want to um welcome orkady on stage and please join me in welcoming the first keynote speaker so by that over to orkady okay thanks thanks very much carl uh, i really appreciate that and um, happy to be involved in lcn and present um, a keynote uh, at lcn so uh, the keynote title is Real-Time Distributed Contextual Intelligence uh, in the Era of Ubiquitous Connectivity. Um, and it's uh, somewhat about distributed contextual intelligence at uh, uh, application level. Uh, but we are also looking at SDNs because SDNs uh, uh, obviously need context uh, to trigger adaptation. Um, and uh, Deakin University is one of seven universities in Melbourne. Melbourne is a big metropolis, uh, 5 million people. Um, and we have seven universities in Melbourne. So Deakin is uh, a university which spans two cities, uh, Melbourne and Geelong. The main campus of Deakin University is in Geelong, which is about 60 kilometers uh, from uh, Melbourne. And Geelong used to be a, a center of auto manufacturing in Australia until uh, auto manufacturers like Ford and uh, Holden uh, and Toyota pulled out of Australia. Um, anyway, so I'll be talking about uh, some, of the, some of the work we did for the last few years. And we started working with uh, context awareness many years ago. Um, and some of my Swedish colleagues also contributed to the work on context awareness. Um, so uh, the outline of my talk, uh, and if you have a question, um, you want some clarification, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. So I'll be setting the scene for IoT, then I'll be talking about um, Horizon 2020 project, Biotop. Uh, then I'll be talking about the theory we developed, which is called context spaces theory. Um, and I'll be talking about a couple of use cases based on our platform that we developed as part of Biotop project. And if time permits, I'll uh, also mention a couple of projects where we ventured into uh, network uh, level uh, context awareness with cross-layer context exchange um, and also quality of experience uh, measurement and optimization. Um, so to um, set the scene, uh, IoT uh, grew out of many disciplines in computer science um, and um, robotics, uh, electrical engineering, networking, artificial intelligence, uh, sensing, sensor development, um, embedded systems, intelligence. So many of those areas contributed to IoT. And primarily, these were pervasive and mobile computing uh, and ubiquitous computing, uh, which uh, were the uh, 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 the, the foundations, uh, the stepstones for Internet of Things. And the definition of Internet of Things um, refers to a distributed system, dynamic global network infrastructure uh, with self-configuring -config capabilities. Um, and with um, uh, talk to those things talk interoperable protocols. Uh, and those things may have um, physical and virtual characteristics, identities, uh, attributes. Um, they use intelligent interfaces uh, and are seamlessly integrated into the information network. So in, in this uh, slide, you can see some of the examples. For example, down there, you can see a honeybee, 
with the sensors on top of it. And this was a project which was called Internet of Things. Um, because uh, researchers in Tasmania were investigating um, why the population of honeybees is declining and what needs to be done to preserve honeybees. Otherwise, uh, we may see no honey in, in a few years time. And they try to uh, monitor behavior of honeybees by putting sensors on top of them, uh, micro sensors, uh, putting them, them on frozen honeybees and then unfreezing them and letting them fly to the um, uh, places. Um, so with uh, IoT, we are moving to the next stage from individual silos. We are moving to IoT ecosystems. And in IoT ecosystems, we have multiple IoT silos or systems or platforms. And usually we represent IoT um, as a three layer uh, architecture with physical uh, layer at the bottom with uh, sensors, uh, observations, uh, signal uh, coming. Um, uh, and, and then we have virtual layer where we have machines, networking infrastructure, virtualization, and then we have uh, decision makers and applications and services and users on top. Uh, and we call this uh, Hall of System Pyramid, IoT Hall of System Pyramid. And then we have data coming uh, bottom up uh, in real time. And then decisions, um, uh, feedback loop, uh, tasking uh, and um, actuation coming top down. And the power of IT is obviously is in real time or near real time um, sensing and observation. So IoT uh, complements and enhances uh, simulation and modeling. So what you can do with the model, you can prepare the uh, enterprise for an application, uh, uh, but, but what happens in real time events that the system has to react to, this can be done with IoT that can work in real time. And that's where we focus our research on. So distributed contextual intelligence in uh, real time applications. So uh, now a few slides about the project. And many of you would be familiar with uh, Horizon 2020 uh, research program in Europe. And uh, Carl kindly introduced me. He mentioned that I worked in Lulia um, and that helped me build my network of contacts in Europe. And since then I was involved in a couple of European projects, FP7 and H H20, Horizon 2020. We built first um, a platform called Open IoT uh, for showing how, uh, how IoT can be integrated into the cloud. And our second project was about building IoT open innovation ecosystem for connected smart objects. And the primary focus of that project was smart cities where we're trying to integrate across multiple uh, silos, multiple IoT subsystems. Um, and this project was part of the IoT EPI, uh, cluster of European projects, uh, IoT European Platform Initiative. And most of those projects were looking at creating interoperable ecosystems, IoT ecosystems. So the project vision um, includes a number of uh, objectives to accelerate a new Internet of Things solutions through easy creation of system of systems. So the IoT ecosystem could, other, in other words, be called a system of systems. Then we try to create smarter IoT systems that can learn, um, that, that, that can build from existing uh, knowledge using ontologies, vocabularies, uh, knowledge bases, um, and then take or propose most appropriate actions, actuate, um, we were able to compose system of systems from new or existing smart objects by using um, interoperability and um, uh, ma marketplace of IoT data and services. And uh, the objective was to establish an open ecosystem for companies to create new software for IoT systems. The project um, was a three-year project and it had 22 partners. Uh, with partners including smart uh, cities like Helsinki and Lyon and Brussels, um, including uh, some companies, um, automakers uh, and universities uh, like EPFL and University of Luxembourg and Aalto University in Helsinki. Um, uh, and, and later on Deakin University. We started this project when I was working at CSRO in Australia, which is the science um, agency in Australia. 
So some of you may have heard of CSROs, Commonwealth Science and Industrial Research Organization. Um, so uh, we, of course, aimed at um, implementing and deploying the tools and platforms we were developing. So we looked at a number of use cases. We looked at smart electric vehicles. We looked at smart buildings. We looked at smart equipment, uh, smart air quality monitoring and prediction. We looked at Helsinki City Pilot, Brussels City Pilot, Lyon City Pilot. And these uh, cities have different uh, portfolios of projects they wanted to implement and services they wanted to deploy. For example, Helsin Helsinki City was interested in snow cleaning and how snow cleaning could be integrated with other silos. Uh, Brussels was interested in um, school kids safety during rush hours and in connecting um, uh, water taxis with buses and looking at, at parking for disabled. And Lyon was interested in mitigating the effects of heat waves by uh, irrigating uh, city boulevards um, and also bottle bank management. As you know, Lyon is in the middle of wine growing region, Loire Valley, and uh, they installed close to 300 bottle banks um, around the city of Lyon uh, for people to dump empty bottles. And then the trucks would be collecting those bottles and optimization and routing of those trucks was part of the uh, use case. And then we also looked at smart management of hard waste in the city of St. Petersburg because uh, ITMO University in St. Petersburg, Russia was also a partner in, in this project. Um, so with um, this brief introduction of the biotop, I'll talk more about the biotop use cases um, in a short while. But let me first introduce what is context so that we are on the same page. Um, and the definition of context um, comes from uh, pervasive ubiquitous computing and most widely cited definition of context comes from the uh, papers by Anin Day and Gregory Abbott. Uh, in late 90s, early 2000s. So they define context as any information that can characterize situation of an entity. So we can also talk about context as inter interpreted data linked to entity and situation entity is involved with. So in this example, you can see uh, three situations, S1, S2, S3, and S3 and S2 are overlapping. And then the entity has its own data but it may not be aware of the context, which is typical for um, outside, for example, that entity. If we take an example of a vehicle, so the vehicle knows its uh, speed, the amount of battery charge. Um, it may even have a driver profile to know whether the driver is experienced or not. Um, it may know also the condition of brakes and the engine, but the vehicle will not know the context on its route. So whether there are any roadblocks or accidents or roadworks, uh, it, may know, it may not know the context of destination. For example, if we look at a quite popular uh, service um, looking for parking, and if we talk about electric vehicles, electric vehicles, when they look for parking, they also look simultaneously for charging point. So um, is uh, charging available at the destination? How much is the cost of the parking spot? So how quickly the parking facility is filling up? So all this information is not available to the vehicle, but is part of the context. And we want those vehicles to be context aware. So we developed um, many years ago, probably 15, 16 years ago, we developed a theory which we call context spaces. And context spaces has been inspired by the uh, state space model by Ogata, automatic control. Um, so in that model, uh, we looked at application space, uh, which could be represent representing as a multidimensional uh, space. Um, and inside that multidimensional space, we can have multidimensional bubbles with less lesser cardinality, for example. And those bubbles would be um, situation spaces. So uh, car, uh, for example, car is looking for parking, one situation. Um, uh, then then uh, car is filling up its uh, battery, charging its battery. That, that could be another situation. Situations could be hierarchical, so could be subsumed by um, uh, situations of a higher order and higher cardinality. So um, 
we we developed uh, na uh, naive context spaces theory. Then we developed uh, context spaces fusion uh, component. We developed a number of engines uh, which work on middleware platforms as well as some engines like um, extended context spaces uh, theory uh, reasoning uh, and adaptation engine. And finally, we developed a platform which we call context as a service. Uh, in Biotop project, everything is offered as a service. Uh, security, uh, billing, um, uh, interoperability, everything was offered as a service. And uh, part of that service offering was context as a service. And other parts of the project were also dependent on the context we provided at runtime. So to give you a, an example of uh, how we view context uh, development and dynamic nature of context, please have a look at this animation. So let's consider um, an object or a person who is walking and uh, walking could be characterized by location, acceleration, heart rate. Then the person could be running. And uh, in addition to uh, location, acceleration, heart rate, we now have respiratory rate. Um, then the person is stationary and uh, the location, acceleration, heart rate and time. And uh, we continuously reason about what's going on and infer situations from uh, context readings, as well as validating situations uh, with context and then if our confidence is not uh, sufficient enough we go back to discover more context so in this particular case time may suggest it's a, a lunch time and that's why stationary situation of a person is considered as eating lunch then we could have uh, unspecified situations and then we can have a situation in the meeting that can be characterized by location light projector activity and time and then in the meeting, it could be a person presenting or a person attending um, or a person uh, supporting a meeting. So it could be different roles for, for those entities, for those objects. And this also could be accompanied by respective context attributes. So with reasoning, we look at probabilistic reasoning. Uh, we look at reasoning and various AI algorithms like Bayesian algorithms. We also use the Dempster rule of integration based on Dempster Schaefer theory by expressing our ignorance of events we know nothing about, but nevertheless, we would like to consider them. Um, and um, uh, context spaces from that point of view integrates all this and provides an approach to purposefully moral and reason about the occurrences or situations with limited available information. Um, what context spaces is also quite good at for validating context. So one of the uh, objectives of uh, creating, of developing that theory, context spaces theory, was to be able to validate context. For example, if we have uh, readings from multiple sensors, should we immediately trust readings of those sensors? For example, we can have a, a reading from a smoke sensor that there is smoke in the building, and um, that could indicate that there could be a fire in the building. But then there is another sensor which says there is no rise in temperature. So does that mean that there is no fire in the building? So we have uh, conflicting uh, sensor readings. Can we validate and identify the sensor which could be malfunctioning or lying? So with context spaces, we can do that by discovering more, uh, more sensors and more readings, more observations to uh, validate uh, and uh, confirm or um, uh, ref refute a particular uh, situation. So with context spaces theory, we also develop context spaces algebra. Um, uh, for, 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 for example, in this diagram, you can see three different situations which could overlap, uh, like situation one, a meeting, situation two, a presentation, and situation three, Friday gathering. And they could, uh, they could be di uh, differing by um, uh, different values of attributes like noise level, uh, number of people involved, and light level. So that's occurrence of situations. And let's now look at uh, context as a service. So let me check time. Okay, I'm doing all right so far. Um, so context as a service uh, vision, uh, it's a middleware platform 
um, which is responsible for providing a uh, kind of a inter inter interface uh, between uh, context providers and context consumers. So we have two types of entities, uh, context, context providers are those entities which provide context. For example, a parking facility, a network router, um, a sensor, um, uh, for example, water level sensor could be context provided to periodically transmit information about the water level in a dam uh, or in the lake. Um, and the second type of entities are context consumers, are those entities which um, request context, which want to be uh, context aware. So with this platform, what we try to do, we try to um, externalize uh, context provisioning um, uh, outside, uh, out of the application. So uh, theoretically, we can make any application context aware by those applications using services of our platform. So we have developed uh, a language called CDKL, Context Definition and Query Language, which um, in, in which entities can express context queries and describe services uh, that can be used to provide uh, context. Um, we also uh, uh, developed mechanism for storing, indexing, and caching context. Uh, context. Um, we also worked on validation and analytics and reasoning in our platform. So what we have done, um, we actually operationalize um, real-time context awareness with our platform. So some of you may be familiar with the OODA loop that comes from um, US Air Force. Um, and uh, that's um, ob observe, orient, decide, act. So that's OODA loop uh, perfectly fits and has been extended with our platform. So what we do, we sense, observe, discover data, uh, context sources. We then validate, interpret data to infer uh, context and make sense of the data we uh, discover or sense. Um, and then we reason, infer situations, context and or situations from the data. And then we do decision support and proactively adapt um, the behavior of a system. And then once the decisions have been confirmed, for example, by human in the loop, by human operators, then the actuating signal is sent to an actuating arm of an IoT system. So this platform has been developed as part of uh, EU Horizon 2020 project Biotop, as I mentioned. Um, and here is an animated architecture of our platform. So context as a service platform consists of three major engines. Um, in the middle, you can see context query engine. Um, up there, you can see context reasoning engine. And at the bottom, you can see context, uh, context storage management system, CSMS. So what happens is that with a step one, um, the context consumer generate a query in CDKL. For example, a car which is looking for parking asks for relevant uh, parking uh, using preferences of a driver um, and, and uh, asks for context of, the, of a destination. Um, then we run the query through usual security layers, uh, authentication, authorization, accounting, auditing, monitoring. Um, and if everything uh, is all right, then the query is passed and processed by context query engine. Then step four in the platform is service discovery. Um, then uh, step five is selection of best matches, which service could best serve the query. Um, we retrieve data context from providers as well as from uh, local storage, um, from uh, local cache. For example, we may store data from um, a parking facility in cache to ensure fast access, uh, near real-time access to that data. But if, uh, for example, the um, uh, time to leave is too long for, for the data, then we may uh, pull a context provider to get uh, an update, uh, a refresh, refresh data from, from context providers in near real-time. Um, then we uh, infer situations, we reason about situations, and one of the powerful uh, features of our platform is 
situation monitoring. So situation monitoring for us means dealing with the situation until it completes. So for example, if the car is looking for parking, then uh, we monitor uh, whether the car can park at the spot and then the situation would be completed. And meanwhile, if anything happens, any events, any data that comes into the system from context providers could indicate that there could be something wrong with the routing or with obstacles or with the destination, then we infer new situations and advise dynamically um, a vehicle of a changed route or perhaps uh, a new destination because the car park which was initially um, planned for parking has been filled up. Um, we do situation monitoring um, and then we do aggregation computation uh, and then uh, do housekeeping with uh, deciding whether to cache the data we received and whether to store the situation and reason about that situation in our knowledge base so that we can bring it up when necessary. Um, and then we respond to a query and context consumer gets its uh, response, its query answer. Now, I also have to uh, mention that this platform is not for end users. It's a middleware platform, which is a productivity tool for developers of context aware applications. So with this platform, um, uh, developers can uh, speed up the development of their applications and um, avoid uh, embedding context awareness into the application and instead using uh, context awareness as an external service. So situation monitoring engine, uh, as I mentioned, is quite an important feature of our platform. So we have a number of blocks in the situation monitoring engine, like situation orchestrator, situation inference manager, um, uh, reasoning engine. Um, and and um, it, the situation monitoring engine is looking at monitoring incoming context and data streams coming from context providers, uh, detecting situations, reasoning about situations, and it's quite a challenge to uh, decide that a value in a data stream should trigger situation reasoning and maybe a consideration of a further routing of a vehicle. But we have a, we, we developed a way of dealing with that. Then we notify context consumer about change situations. And then we can perform or enable the actuation process. So for example, an event, car change location. So sensor ID, current location XY, timestamp such and such. So it is situation monitoring. And then we have situation, user searches for a car park with attributes, distance, car location, destination location should be less than one kilometer because the customer doesn't want to walk longer than one kilometer and it could change to 500 meters or 300 meters. It could even say that the uh, user is uh, looking for a disabled car park, then we will limit it to 50 or 100 meters. Um, and destination, not home of a driver. And driver doesn't have a dedicated car park. So that, that's a situation, description of a situation using CDKL language. So let me now show you how we uh, animate the car park, car, car parking. So it's half an hour, I had, have probably another 10, 15 minutes, right, Carl? Do I? Okay. So um, uh, as I mentioned, um, here you can see a real car with which we experimented. It's i3. And you can see a logo of Biotop on it, on its side. So one of the uh, stakeholders, one of the partners in our Biotop project was a major German auto manufacturer. It has double units name, but it's not Volkswagen. So this, this company was uh, interested in creating smart context-aware electric vehicles. So we uh, looked at uh, charging and parking and also at preconditioning. And I get to preconditioning scenario in a short while. So let's look at uh, the major players in this, uh, in, in this picture. So on the left in the corner, you have backend server, uh, BMW's backend server. Uh, in the right corner, upper right corner, you see context providers, and this could be a vehicle uh, onboard database and uh, weather portal and police database 
and uh, calendar portal. So these are all context providers. And in the middle up there, you can see our uh, platform, which serves as a middleware and uh, a interoperability platform between context providers and context consumers. So a driver requests a route and car park from the backend server. So backend server sends a query to our engine asking for context of uh, route and uh, destination. We pull uh, context, context providers. We get context requests uh, to get uh, up-to-date context from context providers, as well as from our uh, cache. Um, we also may get real-time updates from parking facilities, um, real-time capacity of parking facilities. Um, then context is returned to our platform for reasoning and aggregation. We supply the suggested car parks to the backend server. And the car park, which has been ranked number one, has been identified as a destination for a car. So uh, then the backend server generates a, a route, initial route. And it now asks our platform for context of the route. So we again work with context providers with local cache um, and we get uh, latest updates about traffic congestion, for example, near the stadium. Um, and then we aggregate the context and provide that context to the backend server. Backend server now generates a route and sends it to a vehicle. Vehicle uh, starts uh, driving on the suggested route. And while it moves towards the destination, there is an accident. And we learn about the accident in real time. And uh, this triggers reasoning in our platform that says that if the vehicle will be stuck in the traffic jam, it will not reach its destination in time and the driver uh, or a passenger could be late for a meeting. So then we uh, reason about uh, alternative routes and uh, we inform the backend server about the accident and context for rerouting the vehicle. Uh, the backend server sends a new updated route to the vehicle and the vehicle drives by passing the traffic jam. It may, be, it may take longer distance, but uh, in terms of time, the vehicle arrives on time, uh, parks and start charging. So that's an example of how um, our platform enables uh, smart electric vehicles. Um, another scenario we developed, use case we developed with our stakeholder and partner in Biotop was dealing with preconditioning. So in Australia, yeah, we still need preconditioning because it could be plus 40 outside uh, and the car is warmed up, it's like an oven. Um, and in Europe, it could be, especially in Sweden, where I lived for a few years uh, and Carl is from. So you can have minus 30 outside. And when you want to get in the car, you want some comfortable temperature. And those luxury cars usually tend to provide um, additional comfort to their customers, to users. So in that particular case, we either warm up a vehicle, a car, to a comfortable temperature for the driver or a passenger, or we cool it down using air conditioning. Um, you are looking at all possible uh, parameters and context as well. For example, when we make a decision about switching on air conditioning and the car is not plugged into a power point, then we need to assess the amount of battery charge because if the battery charge is not sufficient to uh, cool down the vehicle and then uh, deliver a passenger and a driver to the destination, then we won't do that. So it's always uh, a matter of trade-offs and balances. So uh, with a car, uh, a car or smart building sends a CDKL query to COAS. COAS uh, checks with context providers, gets the weather bureau, get the temperature near the car, may get even a temperature from the car if car has inbuilt uh, thermometer. Uh, and then we send a preconditioning notification. So in here, you can see an example of a query in CDKL. And in, um, in, in this platform, we use extensively vocabularies and uh, ontologies like schema.org community resource for, uh, for ensuring interoperability between different applications that need to understand the same concept in a uniform and identical way. So here you can see the, um, the, the ontology that we use, schema.org. 
Then you can see the query itself. Um, so select events, event location, driver car, temperature. Uh, when time difference between events and start date is such and such, distance to the car be between the events and such and such, and the event could be a person's home or meeting place, and the distance to the car could be 300 meters. We need to know the pace with which the user can walk. And then um, based on that, we make a decision when the heater or the air conditioning have to switch on. Then there is um, a definition of entities which are involved in that query. And then the actuation using a callback mechanism. So here you can see again with animation how the preconditioning scenario happens. So uh, here a person, we get the location update from the smartphone app on the person's smartphone. When we compute the distance between the person and the vehicle, we compute the temperature uh, uh, which is inside the vehicle and outside temperature. Um, so the location update get, we get from the user. Uh, then um, pl our platform uh, gets uh, information about the events, date, location, from other context providers, and then sends a preconditioning signal to backend server. Backend server sends a preconditioning signal to the vehicle, and the vehicle either cools down or heats up, warms up to enable a comfortable temperature for uh, the user. Um, and that's how that looks like. Again, the preconditioning scenario with um, push because it's situation monitoring situation um, situation monitoring, um, we have two types of queries, pull and push. Um, so with push, the situation monitoring, and then we do preconditioning, and then we convert that into a, um, a query like, like uh, below. So that's um, four of us uh, who did the end-to-end -end testing of uh, the preconditioning scenario. So I'm second from the right, and then there are two of my PhD students on both sides. And then we have Florian from uh, BMW from Munich headquarters. Um, and that's the vehicle in which we did the end-to-end -end testing. Um, I'll see if I can switch on video and if the video could be translated. So we are recording the moment that the air conditioning of the I3 should be switched on. So Florian, Ali, Alexei. So, and we have to record the moment that the air conditioning is not yet switched on. One should turn on, uh, uh, you should, should hear the ventilation. Yeah. Uh, I'll maybe close the door so you can hear it better. Okay. And um, actually there should be a little fan blinking here. Yeah. So I was sitting in the car waiting for the fan to blink. And meanwhile, the query was sent from our platform. You see the- Yes, it's switched on. The air conditioning so was switched on. Blinking. So our platform sent an actuation signal to BMW back and server in Munich. And the signal came back to the vehicle to activate air conditioning. So that was um, uh, kind of a, a quick demonstration of that particular scenario. So we also did some performance evaluation with our platform to check how scalable the platform is because we can anticipate uh, hundreds or thousands of concurrent queries. So if we are servicing um, a large crowd of uh, soccer fans, football fans who are driving to a stadium and want to park around the stadium and quickly run to see the match, then we need to make sure that our platform is scalable and can service concurrently all the users. Um, and uh, scalability proved to be sufficient. Um, there are a bunch of papers published on COAS um, in journals and conferences. So if anyone is interested, please feel free. Now, what to from COAS that we developed uh, as part of Biotop project? And from uh, COAS as, as part of a Biotop project, we are moving now into a distributed, uh, distributed contextual intelligence platform called COYUS. Uh, named after the Greek god of intelligence and far side. Um, and uh, we developed it as a team effort and we added additional components to our platform like machine learning engine and goal planning, the planning engine, ranking and recommender engine. Um, and we also looked at managing uh, disconnection 
because if we are looking at scenarios like bushfire, then we could see uh, disconnected nodes, edge nodes, uh, that may need to maintain some local situational awareness and be able to make independent autonomous decisions um, uh, if, if the connection with the platform is uh, lost. So that's the, uh, the system architecture we are currently building. Um, and um, if I have a few more minutes, I can show you the use case that we are going to deploy that platform in. So as you know, um, bushfires uh, is a regular event in Australia, unfortunate uh, event. So in Australia, uh, bushfires is a way that nature rejuvenates itself. So it's not something unusual. So the uh, eucalyptus, the gum trees, the leaves are quite oily and they don't dissipate. So they don't disintegrate. So the, when the fuel load grows uh, high enough, uh, then there is lightning and this uh, li like a, a charcoal uh, immediately sparks and lights up and creates a bushfire, especially if there is a strong wind and high temperature. So one of the challenges is how to use a fleet of manned and unmanned water bombing aircraft to detect or and mitigate and fight the bushfire. So again, we need, um, we need to identify some of those situations as um, speed, speed is needed because uh, we need to act fast um, because otherwise fire is moving very quickly. So we had uh, a bushfire a few years ago when the fire was moving with the speed of a courier train, 100 kilometers per hour. So we need to move fast and uh, of course notify, identify potential targets and, and um, uh, move wildlife and vulnerable users away from the fire. So access could be difficult or dangerous for ground firefighters if, the, if it occurs in the, in the bushfire in, in the middle of the forest. And observation is needed of fire or impact of intervention. And the stakeholders include landowners, uh, people, tourists, travelers, workers, ground firefighters, aerial firefighters, planners, uh, and those who are looking at uh, controlling and uh, fighting fires. And decisions that need to be made in near real time about movement of ground assets, firefighting trucks, um, movement of aerial assets, those water bombers, um, deployment and redeployment of aerial water bombing assets. And I can show you in a quick example next um, about that. And the situation is non-deterministic uh, and we need to look at resilience and proactivity to try to predict what may happen to prepare for um, dangerous situations on a way. So the data and situations we are looking for aerial water bombing include traffic, air traffic, weather, water bombing aircraft, fuel location, water tank capacity, uh, forest sensors, what is available to measure temperature, humidity, light, smoke, noise, nearby assets, what, what is available to deploy on demand, um, who is nearby in terms of uh, citizens, firefighters, stakeholders, and uh, can we track wildlife to somehow herd it away from the fire. And the situations we are looking at S1, S2, S3 fire, so, it's, uh, so bushfire is burning, and that can be characterized by temperature, humidity, light, smoke, noise uh, context. Fire spreading, we was looking at wind direction and um, it, it's valid. Um, and fire area is increasing uh, by the window and also inaccessible spreading wildfire. Uh, if we identify that um, we can't access the fire with, um, with ground firefighters. And then inaccessible spreading wildfire, um, uh, the situation S3 where we don't have driving routes and distance um, is greater than uh, the opportunity to put it down and the fire speed is greater than the speed of um, ground fires and the fire area is also greater than the area that we can protect. So context queries uh, include those ones. So pool active burn boundaries and incidents, pool possible fire fire threads and locations, pool uh, number of citizens in five kilometer radius of fire thread, threats, uh, pool weather forecast quality near a fire threat, um, pool uh, real-time state of water bombing aircraft, and then push-based queries with situation monitoring, um, monitoring fire threats, uh, high fire threats, fire detection, evacuation, 
and rotor bombing. And um, that's an example so of a bushfire. So do I have a couple of more minutes? Two more minutes, Orkali. Okay, all right. All right, then probably um, I wanted to venture into networking level and cross-layer context exchange, but probably I'll skip it until next time, or you're welcome to send me uh, an email and I'm happy to share the presentation. So each summer, New South Wales has to deal with fire risk. And there are many fires at the same time and could be fires burning in national parks. And there are large towns, small settlements and individual buildings to protect. And the only protection is the rural fire service. And there is increasing use of water bombing aircraft. There was a recent article in the media that with the help of AI, um, uh, air water bombers um, and sensors, we can prevent fires from burning and we can stop fires from burning uh, soon enough. And how to make critical decisions is also a big challenge. So let's, let me run through a scenario. So for example, New South Wales Emergency Service detects a fire uh, near Monga. Um, our platform detects report, notifies Batemans Bay Royal Fire Service. Uh, the Royal Fire Service reacts to the fire and uh, activated to respond. Um, where bef uh, when it starts moving towards the fire, our platform detects the fire is spreading and now um, uh, the, the road towards the fire is under threat. So air water bombing aircraft dispatched from Canberra to Batemans Bay. Um, the aircraft dumps water on the fire. Um, and puts the fire down to free up the road for the road fire service to move towards the fire in the national park. Um, so the platform uh, based on um, sensing and monitoring and uh, image processing detects that uh, the fire is out and the Royal Fire Service can, can proceed. Um, then there are, there are detection from social networks uh, from Facebook and Twitter that uh, there is smell of smoke from the vest um, in a particular place called Neringla. Um, and Coyus looking uh, and suggests, uh, makes a decision to divert the aircraft, returning aircraft uh, to determine fire risk. So the returning aircraft flies over the area, takes pictures, takes, sens sen uh, takes sensor readings, observes um, fires, and uh, then also detects strong westerly winds near Tindri. Uh, our platform analyzes photos along with weather data, determines the Talanganda National Park is at risk, dispatches the fleet of drones to search for fires. Drone swarm operates independently, searching for fires and dumping uh, uh, water in uh, water tanks to the fires. Um, and then also air water bombing aircraft is dispatched from Kuma to dump water on the fires if um, drones are incapable of uh, totally putting the fire down. So that's uh, that's kind of a uh, the animated scenario we are currently developing the system that will be deployed in such scenarios so uh, this is my last slide to um, have some time for questions and discussion so if if there are any questions please uh, let me know and thanks very much for listening and looking forward to questions thanks a lot Arkady, for this uh, very interesting presentation from many aspects both theory and a lot of uh, practical applications that's very nice to see so i'll open up the floor for questions we are not that many so i think you can speak out loudly go ahead anyone we'll take it first come first serve sure yeah while well, i'm still sharing the screen or i can yeah. stop sharing the screen stop sharing the screen yeah, anyone? Otherwise, I can ask some questions. It's both the um, work that you did in the Biotope project and some existing work in Australia and the plans for the future in any direction, Um Yeah, it is the work that started um, back in Melbourne when I worked at Monash University and then continued on with my work at Lulia. So if you remember both Krista and Robert, uh, brainstorm. They used context awareness, but not the, not the theory we developed. But Karen, who is currently working at LTU, was my PhD student who used context spaces mm -hmm. for his PhD project. And Saguna also used context spaces. And then after coming back from Sweden to Australia, I continued that work. 
especially given that uh, I was involved in two European projects, Open IT and Biotop. And in Biotop, our work on context awareness has been realized as a platform. So from theory and prototypes, we moved to a uh, experimental platform. And now we are ready to deploy this platform in use cases and various applications. And um, if there is any interest to look at the platform closer, so it's available um, as a Docker mm -hmm. for playing with. Nice. Good. Anyone? Keep your anxious about the coffee break, I guess. Yeah, I don't want to stand between uh, uh, between the participants and yeah. the coffee break. Sure. <laughs> we can see someone wrote in the chat. Yes. Maybe you can read that, Orkiri. Okay, let me let me open the chat window. Yeah, do you have any way to specify real-time constraints is the question. Um, chat, okay. Um, okay, so there are there are two questions. Two questions, exactly. If you have a look at the data privacy concerns for this core system, mm -hmm. it seems like it is a hub which has access to many data sources, which could also be abused. Um, absolutely, but we have a data privacy policy and uh, our uh, service provisioning is privacy aware. So we check who has access to what information and we try to uh, also predict um, whether privacy may be abused. But as um, kind of a mobile distributed networking community, we also should, uh, should think about the balance between usability and privacy. So if we want the service to be usable, we may need to sacrifice some privacy. Uh, and if we want complete privacy, we should uh, cut all our communication lines and get off Facebook and Twitter and all the social networks and have no access to the internet. So that's kind of a balance between uh, usability and uh, quality of service, quality of experience versus privacy. So that, that's kind of a, but definitely, yeah, we, uh, the, the security and privacy were not the main focus of our platform. We used uh, OAUS 2.0 framework for providing security, so authentication authorization. And we have some elements of privacy preservation. Um, with COAS, we also are a member of ETSI, European Technology Standards Institute, uh, Telecommunication Standards Institute. And we are working with the uh, ISG industry special group on context management platforms, uh, trying to define and um, develop standards for privacy preservation. So uh, we, we, if, if let's say any stakeholder, any customer wants commercial deployment of our platform with the focus on privacy, we'll definitely develop um, a layer to ensure privacy preservation. So that, that's to Fabian. And then there is another question. Do you have any way to specify real-time campaigns? Yes, yes, we do. We do. So as I mentioned, our platform is a middleware platform for developers. Now it's a, uh, an opportunity for developers to provide interactive um, interaction with the user to develop real-time constraints or uh, or if it's a device, then we can get um, context from a device and that, device, and that uh, context could turn into a constraint, into a rule that can be immediately applied as a filter to context and situation reasoning. So we definitely have a way to do that. We can specify a situation uh, dynamically at runtime and that becomes a, a real-time constraint. Um, any other, other question? We have, we have a few minutes left. Either you can write in the chat or just speak freely. We yeah. are 36 people in the room, so it's not that much. Just don't ask me to stand up. <laughs> beneath my shirt, there are shirts. <laughs> we have 25 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> yeah. Nice to hear. Yeah, we are going into summer, so we had 32 yesterday, 25 today. Yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah. So, guys, what do you say? Should we thank Orkady with the applause from where we are? So, thanks a lot, Orkady. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for, for delivering the, yeah. the talk. And we stay in touch and uh, 
hopefully sooner than later. We Absolutely. will meet again. Yeah. Happy yeah. to take questions online, yeah, yeah. email, and communicate if anyone is interested in trying or kind of uh, deploying our platform. Yeah. All the best. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yes. Bye -bye. We stay in touch. Bye bye. Stay in touch. Bye bye.